Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your Creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 340 for the third of Cheshvan in a leap year. There is a philosophical principle, which has often been applied to science and to many other things, called Occam's Razor. What is Occam's Razor? So Occam's Razor, which is also called the law of economy, was established by a philosopher named William of Oakham. And in brief, reading off of a website on Britannica.com, Oakman's razor is that plurality should not be posited without necessity. Or in other words, if you have two competing theories, then the simpler explanation is to be preferred. So the basic idea in simple English is that uh, the simple answer is, is the one to, that we should assume is correct. And this is very much applicable, I believe, to today's Tanya. Because in today's Tanya, what we're going to be looking at, and we're going to be concluding an epistle that we've been learning so far, the Ultra Rebbe is going to be positing this principle, this idea of simplicity. And he's going to be saying, like, basically what it is that he's been trying to kind of prove and like the response, this this whole epistle that we've been learning is a response to certain people who, ch- who were challenging certain ideas. His response to them is really very similar to this Occam's razor. It's, it's a return to simplicity. And that the principles that he is, has been trying to teach in this epistle are actually nothing new, but they're actually basic core uh tenets of Judaism, and they only got challenged once people started thinking in more complex and kind of complicating things. So he, it's kind of a return to simplicity. However, it should be noted that in addition to this message about the return to simplicity that we're going to learn today, the Ultra Rebbe also emphasizes that while it is kind of like a return to simplicity kind of concept, um, it is it doesn't mean that the concept itself is simple. You know, just like a lot of times, like it going back to the Occam's razor analogy, you can have scientific theories that it's like, okay, you pick this theory because it's the simplest one. It's the most straightforward one. It doesn't mean the theory is going to be simple. You might, you know, um, need a lot of education and a lot of background in order to understand it. So he's going to address that p- part as well. And he's going to explain it to the point that this, these ideas that he's been teaching are actually so deep and not so like kind of like easy to understand to the point that it's it's difficult for him to put it in writing and he actually is recommending that these opposers send a person to him that he could discuss with in person face to face because he feels that that would be actually a lot more beneficial than just what is in writing here so what is the discussion what is it that we're, we've been talking about so if you've been following along the past few episodes you probably have this idea but just to kind of bring it together and a little bit of a review is what what's been going on is the question of, is God present in everything in the world? Like, meaning even those things that are really negative, that are really the antithesis of God, like an idol worshiper, you know, who worships something other than God, uh, a mass murderer, for example, he doesn't bring that example, but it's something that comes to mind, you know, really evil, really bad people, like, is God really present in them? How can we say something like that? Like, what does that mean? And the Ultra Rebbe has been arguing for the fact that, yes, God is present in those things, and everything is a message of God. And uh, the applicability of this teaching has been brought up in the case of anger management and how it is, how, uh, why it is that anger is likened to idolatry uh, in, Ju- in Jewish sources. And this is because of this very idea that, that anger, why, what is anger? Anger is where there is a lack of faith, a lack of acknowledgement in God, because 
whatever it is that you're angry at, whether it's a circumstance or a person or something like that, if you don't really fully believe that that person or that circumstance was sent to you by God and that God is invested within that person, then yes, there's a reason to be angry at that person or situation. However, if you truly believe that uh, and you truly acknowledge that God is very much present and vested within that individual that's making you angry, then there's no reason to be angry at that individual because really it's it's God that's animating the person that's that's keeping the person in existence, something for nothing all the time. So this was a teaching of the Baal Shem Tov, and there were opposers of the Baal Shem Tov, opposers to the Hasidic movement who used this to kind of say that the, the Baal Shem Tov promoted heretical ideas and that this isn't really Judaism and that God is not present in those kind of things and stuff like that. Like it's, it's a, it's a very deep debate. And yesterday the ultra bet concluded the section kind of bring up the idea that perhaps we're talking about linguistics here and that like when in the writings of the uh the Baal Shem Tov it says Hashra'a Tashchina the uh the like indwelling of the Shechina whereas it really should have said the investment of the Shechina like the um the clothing of the Shechina the Shechina being clothed in the individual but today he's going to say that you know these semantics which really were only there just because nothing the Baal Shem Tov didn't actually write down anything this these were just his students who were and his teaching so the wording is not actually that exact exact the ultra is going to take it further and he says that these this argument about semantics is not actually the argument that's going on he's saying that the people that challenge the te this teaching actually are challenging it even on the level of the shina being vested within these things that they deny this and he says that in fact these people that are denying this are denying not just the Baal Shem Tov, but they're denying its a core teaching of the Arizal uh, who came way before the, the Baal Shem Tov, and in fact are denying a core principle of Judaism. So let's get into the text and see how the Altar Rebbe explains all of this and her context. Again, we are in Epistle 25 and today we're going to be concluding Epistle 25 in Iyar HaKodesh. So the Altar Rebbe begins and he says that it seems to me, it seems to the Ultra Rebbe that this um this seizing of this passage where they say like this idea of the hashra atashina where they're like, oh, you know, how is it that God dwells within this person, dwells within evil? Like you're saying God wants evil to happen. Uh he, he's saying it's not just a question of semantics, where it's like it shouldn't say dwell, it should actually say enclose or that kind of thing. But he says actually they even have a problem with this idea of the shina being enclosed, invested within the clipos themselves. Because the Ultra Rebbe says they don't have faith in that in what it is that the Arizal taught in the Sefer HaGil Golem in the Book of Reincarnation, which we spoke about previously, which is this, this idea of the investment of the Shechina in all four worlds, in the Malchus of all four worlds. We spoke about that in, in some episodes episodes prior and so like a person might interpret this to mean like okay this is talking about it on a spiritual level that that uh, the Shekhinah is being invested in what are known as the Klipos which are like the spiritual like inhibitors to godliness the husks that that uh, inhibit godliness but what about actual physical idolaters and things like that so the ultra Rebbe says that um if you want to make this distinction between spirituality and physicality, what's the most physical thing there is, is dust of the earth, right? And nevertheless, we do know there is this core principle that the that the malchus of malchus of Asiya, which in which is vested the malchus of, of Yitzira, etc., as explained above. So meaning that like within the malchus of malchus of Asiya, there's a chain all the way back up to the Malchus of Atzillus, which is ultimately sourced back to God himself, right? Which is, and, and uh, as manifest through the Shechina, which we call Malchus. So the physicality of the earth is the most physical thing there is. And we know that there, that within this physicality of the earth, the dust of the earth, this Malchus of Malchus of Asiya is invested. And so why is it like if, if we, if people can accept this, that, okay, yes, uh, the Shekhinah is invested within those things, then why would somebody have a problem understanding the idea that the Shekhinah would also be invested in the impurity of the Gentile nations, of the Gentile souls? Uh, because these souls, they also come from this Zivug, from this union of the Zer Anpin and the Nukva. The Zer Anpin is the the masculine elements, it's the the six uh, emotive attributes and the nukva, the malchus of of the the spiritual klipos 
as is written in the, the writings of the Arizal. So it's like, basically the ultra is saying, you can't really make this distinction between physical and spiritual. Like you can't just say that like, okay, we know that the klipos from, come, come from God and that whole outline of the klipos come from God but and come from the Shekhinah, but physicality, that's something else. And like, you know, physical idolaters, that's something else. It's like, no, because what is the source of these idolaters? They come from the klipos, which come from God. And so this shows that the spirituality is the source of their impurity. So then the ultra Rebbe says, he says, but truly, you know, he kind of like takes a step backwards here. And he says, it's true that this actually needs a very broad explanation. How does this investment happen? Because it's not like he kind of like, he doesn't want to dismiss the question entirely because it is a very paradoxical thing. If there's God and God, you know, uh, is creating everything. How is it that God, it's kind of like the thing of like, can God create a rock that is too strong for him to move? Like, it's a little bit that question. Like, how is it or why is it? Like, how does this happen exactly that God creates something and not only creates something, but God is actually invested within something uh, and is the vivifying force behind something that's the exact antithesis of God. That's whole being and substance is to hide God, to conceal God, to to uh, not have God be manifest. So, so the ultra bit addresses this question, and he says that the truth is um, this this complaint, this question, this uh, challenge is not to us. We, he says, we aren't the originators of this idea, but it's actually in the writings of the Orizal. So he's kind of like relying on the teachings of the Orizal. He's saying, I'm not inventing these ideas. It's coming from the Orizal. And he says that, and people shouldn't imagine that maybe I'm like misunderstanding the Orizal somehow. And that, um, that it's that it, that I'm like somehow taking them out of their context because no he says I'm here only in order to explain the teachings of the Bel Shem Tov uh, of blessed memory and his students according to the Kabbalah of the Arizal so he's basically saying again he's relying on the teachings of the Arizal these aren't just his ideas that he came up with out, out of the blue and not only this, he says, it's not only just like, these are like Kabbalistic teachings that are just like very secretive and only God himself knows them. And it's not like our realm of understanding, but rather he says, these are things that, that are in the realm of Haniglot This is the, the this is a, a citation from Devarim chapter 29, verse 28. So the first one is like in that verse, it's, um, it's it's it has those things that are concealed to God and then that are revealed to us and to our children. So he says there's some things truly that are concealed and are the realm of God and then and then there are things that are revealed to us. So he says this category of thing that we're talking about, yes, it's something that might be like really difficult for us to understand, but it's not actually in the realm of just like pure Kabbalah that is outside of our realm of understanding. It's actually something that is revealed to us and we should with this with this principle is something that we should have total faith with full faith in this principle as is manifest through um, a, a verse that's found in Yirmiyahu chapter 23 verse 24 Hello that do I not fill the heavens and the earth says God so uh, and and the ultra Rabbi says it this that he cites here the Gemara in Masechet Shabbos page 63a um, that there's this principle of scripture does not depart from its plain meaning. So meaning to say, when we say, do I not fill the heaven and the earth about God? That means God literally fills the heaven, heavens and the earth. And not only that, but he says that this is actually a simple principle of faith for all Jews. And this is a tradition that has been brought down to us from our holy forefathers that walked with Tmimus, walked purely with God. So uh, meaning to say that he's saying this is the Okam's razor part. He's saying this is a simple principle. This is something that for generations upon generations, Jews always had this simple faith and this acknowledgement that everything in the world is from God and God is is found within everything in the world. And it's not something that like people, this idea, and people did this, people believed, Jews believe this throughout the generations without examining this and getting into philosophy with a human idea about the idea of godliness because 
because godliness is something that's above our understanding and it's something that's like infinitely above our understanding to try to understand how it is that he fills all the worlds this is something that's super rational it's not something that we can actually understand and people and it and it people in the past never tried to understand it we just accepted it on pure faith and he says it's actually a new thing that the new ones came and they started coming into this hakira into this like philosophizing about this idea and he says it's not something you can't understand this kind of thing this is not something uh that that a person can come to with reason without first accepting certain promises that are taken from the writings of the Orizal that are divested from their physical connotation. As I learned, meaning as the altar of it learned from his masters, meaning from the Magid of Mazarich and from the Baal Shem Tov, may their souls rest in Eden. So meaning to say that he's, the basic idea is that the altar is saying that, that, uh, that these, th this principle of God dwelling within everything and being in everything, uh, just like that, that this is something that was accepted throughout the generations. And it was an article of like a principle of our faith. Um, but yet it's not something rational. So these people that came around later and tried to rationalize these kind of things and try to understand this concept. Yeah. You're not going to understand it rationally. It's not a rational idea you need to accept certain promises that come from the Arizal in order to understand it. And these promises, the, uh, the ultra is saying he, he, um, got, he was taught these things by his teachers and, um, it comes from the Arizal, but his teachers taught him these teachings of the Arizal. And he says that actually, and he expresses the limitation of the written word. And he says that this, it's really difficult to explain this properly in writing, but rather it's something that needs to be explained from mouth to ear to very um, specific individuals. So he uses a citation to uh, to um, describe these special individuals from Yoel chapter three, verse five, where it says, Hashem kore to the remnants whom God calls. As a side note, personal note here, that verse contains my name. So the, the la sridim, sridim is the plural of sarid, which is my name. So very cool. And so it's basically the, the translation of that is the remnants that like those who kind of survived, like the, the meaning to say, like in the context of what we're talking about here is these are the people who like, they were left really understanding like they they're unique amongst the people who are able to understand this principle and then the altar of it brings another citation this time from mishle chapter 28 verse 5 which means and they who seek god will understand all so meaning it's like certain people like people who really want to get it real truth seekers those special kind of people, they will be able to understand it, but it might have to be more in a face-to-face -face discussion rather than just something that he's writing here because he's finding it difficult to explain these ideas in writing. And then the Ultra Rebus cites a kind of confrontational um, citation here. This is from Sifre from the Midrash, Akiv 11.19, Miklal Hena Tashomer love so from the affirmative you from the affirmative you may infer the negative so meaning what he's trying to say here is like he's not explicitly saying it but he's saying kind of like that like well you know if only those people who are true truth seekers those special individuals they're the only ones that are going to be able to understand this idea well the implication of that is that those people who are not really truth seekers see truth seekers like not really sincere and in, um in what it is in their knowledge they will not be able to understand this these ideas and so now the altar Rabbi concludes this section and he says that like okay so now with all of this in mind i've shown you guys like meaning these oppo op opponents as an explanation of a single passage meaning this passage in the tzivata harubash the testament of the Baal Shem Tov, about this idea of of um of the Shekhinah dwelling within the within a, a, an idolater or whatever. And so he said, I've, I've explained this one thing. And he says, you should use this as an example that all of the different sayings, all of the passages, they all have explanations. Like they're not based on nothing and they're known um, and they're explained by those who know Kabbalah. So basically he's saying that to the opposers out there, these teachings of Hasidus are not based on nothing. They all have a source. And this was one example that he gave, but really all everything has a source in this way. And he's and however, he says they shouldn't think that I'm going to explain all of this in writing uh, because this is a very hard and extensive work to do. And 
Actually, it's impossible to be able to explain everything in writing, but if you want, if you're really interested in knowing the truth, you should send one of your people to come and um, from your community, the per a person who's appropriate from your community, and I will speak to him face to face, and I'll, I'll have a discussion with him about this. And, uh, and he, then he concludes here, and he says that God should be with my mouth, and may the May the uh, words of my mouth find favor. That's a that's a citation from Tehillim chapter 19, verse 15. And so that's the end of this section for today, the end of this epistle. And so tomorrow we are going to begin a new epistle, um, epistle 26, and I will speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast, hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Abraham Yitzhak ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Top project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.